Imagine this. A beloved 70-year-old grandmother is suddenly stopped by police in her own front yard. What happens next will shock you. But here's the twist. Her son is the police commissioner, and he's about to face an impossible choice. What do you think he'll do? Stay tuned to find out the explosive truth that changes everything. The sun was warm, casting a golden glow over the quiet suburban street. Eleanor Hampton knelt in her front yard, hands gently patting the soil around a budding rosebush. Her wide-brimmed straw hat shielded her face, but her smile peeked out as she hummed a tune, a habit born from years of church choir practice. She cherished these tranquil moments, the scent of fresh earth mingling with the delicate perfume of blooming flowers. The serenity shattered when two police cruisers pulled to a stop on the curb. Eleanor glanced up, puzzled. Officers stepped out, their movements brisk and purpose-driven. A middle-aged man with a square jaw and mirrored sunglasses approached first, followed by a younger, hesitant officer trailing behind. Ma'am, the older officer said, his voice clipped. We've had a report of suspicious activity in the area. Mind if we ask you a few questions? Eleanor rose slowly, brushing dirt off her gloves. Her calm demeanour masked the slight tremor in her chest. Suspicious activity? Here? I've been out front all afternoon tending to my garden. The officer didn't respond directly. Instead, his eyes scanned her property, taking in the neatly trimmed hedges and the well-maintained porch. Do you live here? Yes, I do. For over thirty years, Eleanor replied, her tone even. May I ask what this is about? The officer exchanged a glance with his partner, who fidgeted nervously. We're going to need to search your property. Please step aside. Eleanor's brow furrowed. Search my property? On what grounds? I assure you there's nothing suspicious here. I'm just a retired schoolteacher enjoying her garden. The officer's tone sharpened. We're not here to debate, ma'am. Step aside. Eleanor's spine straightened. She pulled off her gloves and rested them on the garden wall. I'm sorry, officer, but unless you can provide a warrant or a clear reason, I can't allow you to search my home. This is my right. Her calm assertion seemed to irritate him. Ma'am, don't make this difficult. Neighbours had begun to gather, peering from porches and windows. A young woman across the street pulled out her phone, recording the scene. The presence of onlookers didn't deter the officer. His hand hovered near his belt, a subtle but clear intimidation tactic. Eleanor took a steadying breath. I want to cooperate, but I also want to be treated fairly. My son, Commissioner Charles Hampton, has always emphasised the importance of respecting the law. Perhaps you've heard of him? The officer stiffened at the name, but didn't back down. We don't care who your son is, ma'am. Step aside now. The words cut through Eleanor like a cold wind. She wasn't accustomed to being dismissed so harshly. Humiliation swirled in her chest, but she refused to let it show. Her voice, though soft, was resolute. Then I'd like you to call him. I believe he'd want to hear about this. The younger officer hesitated, glancing at his superior. Maybe we should... Quiet, the older man snapped. Mum. This is your last warning. The tension was palpable. The bystanders whispered among themselves, their voices a mix of concern and outrage. The young woman filming edged closer, her phone steady. Eleanor caught her eye briefly and gave her a small nod, as if to say, keep recording. The truth matters. Realising the standoff wasn't going in their favour, the officers muttered something into their radios and stepped back. We'll be watching. The older one said before retreating to his car. The cruisers pulled away, leaving Eleanor standing in her garden, surrounded by the weight of her neighbour's gazes. She adjusted her hat and resumed her gardening, though her hands trembled slightly as they touched the soil. By the time evening fell, the video of the encounter had gone viral. Clips of the officer's stern demands, Eleanor's calm defiance, and the murmurs of the growing crowd spread like wildfire across social media. The caption read, they didn't know she was the commissioner's mother. Miles away, in a downtown skyscraper, Commissioner Charles Hampton sat in a sleek conference room,
presenting his department's latest reforms to a group of city officials. His phone buzzed relentlessly in his pocket, but he ignored it, focused on the task at hand. It wasn't until the meeting ended and his assistant pulled him aside, her face pale, that he realised something was wrong. Sir, she said, holding up her tablet, you need to see this. The video played, the voices crackling slightly, but the images were clear. Charles's jaw tightened as he watched his mother calmly face the officer's blatant disrespect. He replayed the clip twice, his mind racing. His mother, Eleanor. The woman who had instilled in him a deep sense of integrity and fairness had been treated like a criminal in her own yard. The assistant hesitated. The media's already picked it up. They're calling for a statement. Charles nodded, his expression unreadable. Schedule a meeting with the officers involved, immediately. As he strode toward his office, his phone buzzed again. This time, it was a call from Eleanor. He answered, his voice steady but tight. Mum, are you okay? Eleanor's voice was calm, but he could hear the weariness behind it. I'm fine, Charles. No need to worry. It's nothing I can't handle. It's not nothing, Charles said firmly. This shouldn't have happened. Perhaps not, Eleanor replied. But it did. And now it's up to you to make sure it doesn't happen again. Her words stayed with him long after the call ended. As Charles prepared for the confrontation ahead, one thing was clear. This was no longer just about his mother. It was about the systemic flaws he had sworn to fix and the personal stakes that made failure unacceptable. Charles Hampton leaned back in his office chair, staring at the muted cityscape through the glass windows. The sun was setting, casting streaks of orange and purple across the skyline, but Charles hardly noticed. His mind was locked on the video still playing on the tablet in his hands. The familiar image of his mother, Eleanor, standing firm in her garden, confronted by two officers who had no idea who she was, or maybe they didn't care, played on a loop in his head. Her voice, calm but resolute, had been a lifeline for him as a child. Hearing it now in such a context filled him with a mix of pride and fury. A knock on the door broke his reverie. His assistant, Nina, stepped in, holding a stack of papers. Sir, the mayor's office has called twice. They want to know how you plan to handle this. Charles nodded, setting the tablet aside. And the media? They're circling like hawks. The video's already hit every major network. Headlines like, Racism on the suburban front lawn are trending. Charles rubbed his temples. Schedule a press briefing for tomorrow. No comments until then. Nina hesitated. And the officers? I want them in my conference room first thing in the morning, Charles said firmly. No excuses. As Nina left, Charles remained still, the weight of his decision pressing on him. He knew this case wasn't just another personnel issue. It was personal. But more than that, it was a test of everything he'd worked for. His principles, his leadership, and his belief that the system could change. The video stirred memories Charles hadn't revisited in years. He saw himself as a boy, no older than eight, walking home from the grocery store with Eleanor. Back then, they lived in a neighbourhood that treated them like outsiders. He remembered the day they'd been stopped by an officer, one who looked a lot like the one in the video. Where are you two headed? The officer had barked, his hand resting on his holster. Young Charles had felt his mother's grip tighten on his hand. She'd answered with a soft, respectful tone. But the officer's sneer had made Charles feel small, invisible, and angry all at once. That moment had planted a seed in him, a determination to rise above that anger and prove that not all authority figures abused their power. Years later, he joined the police academy, determined to make a difference. But now, decades into his career, Watching his own mother endure the same humiliation, he couldn't help but wonder, have I done enough? By the time morning arrived, Charles was clear-eyed and ready. He had spent hours reviewing reports and body cam footage from the officers involved. The footage showed what the viral video couldn't, the casual condescension in their tone, the dismissive glances, the reluctance to even listen to Eleanor's explanation. 
Charles called the emergency meeting and the officers arrived with varying degrees of unease. Officer Daniels, the senior officer who had spoken to Eleanor, sat with his arms crossed, his body language defiant. Officer Brady, younger and clearly nervous, kept his gaze fixed on the table. Charles stood at the head of the conference room, his presence commanding but not overbearing. Gentlemen, he began, I've reviewed the footage from your body cams and the viral video of your interaction with Eleanor Hampton. Do either of you have anything to say before I continue? Daniels shrugged. We were responding to a call, sir, following procedure. And what exactly about my mother screamed suspicious activity to you? Charles asked, his voice steady but cold. Brady shifted uncomfortably. We, uh, we thought she might have matched the description we were given. What description was that? Charles pressed. A black woman gardening in her own yard. Daniel stiffened. With respect, Commissioner, we don't have the luxury of second-guessing calls in the field. We followed protocol. Charles leaned forward, his voice sharpening. Protocol doesn't excuse bias. Protocol doesn't justify humiliating an elderly woman on her own property. Brady opened his mouth to speak, but faltered. Daniels, however, stood firm. If you think we acted improperly, Commissioner, we'll follow whatever disciplinary action you see fit. But I stand by my decision. The tension in the room was palpable. Charles knew he had to tread carefully. Dismissing Daniels outright could be seen as a personal vendetta, undermining his credibility. But letting this slide would be a betrayal of his mother and everything he believed in. You'll both report to Internal Affairs for a full review, Charles said finally. This department doesn't tolerate misconduct, intentional or not. As the officers left, Charles felt the eyes of his colleagues on him. He knew some would see his actions as decisive leadership, while others would view it as weakness. The department had always been divided on his reform policies. This incident would only deepen those divisions. That evening, Charles drove to Eleanor's house, pulling into the familiar driveway. The house looked as it always had, warm, inviting, a testament to his mother's strength and grace. He found her in the living room, sipping tea and watching the news coverage of her own ordeal. She greeted him with a soft smile. You didn't have to come all this way, Charles. Yes, I did, he said, taking a seat across from her. I saw the video. I talked to the officers. Eleanor nodded, setting her teacup down. And? They'll face an internal review, he said. I'll make sure they're held accountable. Eleanor studied him for a long moment. I don't envy your position, son. Balancing your duty to your department with your duty to what's right. It's a heavy burden. It shouldn't have happened, Charles said, his voice low. Not to you. Not to anyone. Eleanor reached across the table, placing her hand over his. You can't fight every battle, Charles. Focus on the ones that matter. This one matters, he said firmly. She smiled again, but he could see the faint lines of weariness on her face. I trust you'll do what's right. Just remember, change takes time. Don't let this break you. As he drove home that night, her words echoed in his mind. Eleanor had always been his compass, guiding him toward fairness and integrity. He would honour her wisdom, but he would also ensure that justice was served. Charles sat alone in his office, the glow of his computer screen casting sharp shadows across the room. On the screen, the body cam footage from officers Daniels and Brady played out in excruciating detail. Each frame was a stark reminder of the casual disrespect his mother had endured. Ma'am. Don't make this difficult, Daniels' voice barked, cold and commanding. The footage showed Eleanor standing tall, her tone steady as she questioned their intentions. But Daniels had dismissed her words, barely masking his impatience. Brady's unease was evident, his body language stiff and awkward as if he knew the situation was wrong but lacked the courage to speak up. Charles paused the video, leaning back with a sigh. His mother's calm resolve had kept the encounter from escalating, but the implicit bias in the officer's actions was undeniable. This wasn't just a case of poor judgment. 
It was a symptom of deeper issues within his department, ones he had fought to address since becoming commissioner. The following morning, Charles summoned Daniels and Brady to his office. The tension was thick as they entered. Daniels walked in first, his posture rigid, his expression unreadable. Brady followed, avoiding eye contact and shifting his weight from foot to foot. Charles didn't waste time with pleasantries. I've reviewed the body cam footage, he began, his voice calm but firm. It's clear that your actions during the interaction with Eleanor Hampton were inappropriate and demonstrated a lack of respect. Daniels raised an eyebrow. With all due respect, sir, we were responding to a call. The situation required us to act quickly. To act quickly, Charles repeated, his tone sharpening. Or to act without thinking. At no point did you attempt to verify the report before approaching an elderly woman in her own yard. Your tone was dismissive and condescending, and you ignored her entirely when she tried to explain herself. Brady shifted uncomfortably, glancing at Daniels who remained defiant. We followed protocol, Daniel said, his jaw tightening. If you have a problem with that, maybe it's the protocol that needs fixing. Charles's eyes narrowed. Protocol doesn't excuse bias, Officer Daniels, and it doesn't excuse a lack of basic decency. The room fell silent for a moment, the tension crackling like static electricity. Brady finally spoke, his voice hesitant. Commissioner, I... I wasn't comfortable with how things went down, but Daniels was leading the call, and I didn't think it was my place to step in. Charles turned to him, his tone softening slightly. It's always your place to do the right thing, Officer Brady. Following orders doesn't absolve you of responsibility. Daniels scoffed, folding his arms. With all due respect, sir, this feels more like a personal vendetta than a professional review. Charles stiffened. Excuse me? You're the commissioner, Daniels continued, his tone laced with subtle defiance. But we all know there's been pushback on some of your policies. Some of us are just trying to do our jobs without getting caught up in politics. Charles leaned forward, his gaze piercing. This isn't politics. This is about ensuring every citizen is treated with respect no matter their background, or who they happen to be related to. Do you understand me? Daniels didn't reply, but the challenge in his eyes was unmistakable. Charles dismissed them, his mind already turning over the deeper implications of Daniels's words. As the day wore on, Charles began piecing together the broader context. A conversation with Nina confirmed his suspicions. Daniels wasn't acting alone. He had ties to a senior figure in the department, Deputy Chief Harrington, who had been a vocal opponent of Charles's reform initiatives from the start. Harrington had a reputation for protecting his own, often shielding officers from accountability under the guise of department loyalty. It was an open secret, one that had created a culture of impunity among certain ranks. Charles knew confronting Harrington would be a delicate matter. The deputy chief wielded significant influence and any misstep could escalate tensions within an already divided department. But ignoring the issue wasn't an option. That evening, Charles reviewed his options. He could discipline Daniels and Brady directly, but without addressing the systemic issues at play, it would be a hollow gesture. He needed a stronger, more comprehensive response, one that would send a clear message about accountability while also addressing the root causes of the problem. The next morning, Charles convened a meeting with his senior staff. The room was filled with murmurs as he entered, the weight of the previous days hanging over everyone. I've made a decision, Charles announced, silencing the room. In light of recent events, I'm calling for an independent review of our department's policies and practices. The announcement was met with mixed reactions. Some officers nodded in quiet approval, while others exchanged sceptical glances. Harrington, seated near the back, leaned forward with a frown. Commissioner, with all due respect, an independent review will only add fuel to the fire. It'll make the department look weak. We look weak, Charles countered, when we fail to hold ourselves accountable. Trust from the community is earned, not given. Harrington's frown deepened. 
but he didn't argue further. Charles could feel the resistance simmering beneath the surface, but he pushed on. I've already reached out to external auditors, Charles continued. This review will include an examination of implicit bias in our training programs, as well as an analysis of misconduct cases from the past five years. The goal isn't to point fingers, it's to ensure that our department lives up to the values we claim to uphold. The room was silent as Charles finished. He knew the decision would be controversial, but it was a necessary step. Change, he had learned, was rarely comfortable. Later that evening, Charles called Eleanor to update her on the situation. She listened patiently, her calm voice grounding him as it always had. You're doing the right thing, Charles, she said. But remember, change doesn't happen overnight. Don't let the resistance discourage you. I won't, Charles promised but it's hard not to feel like I'm swimming against the tide. Eleanor chuckled softly. The tide always turns, son. It just takes time and a lot of persistence. Her words stayed with him long after their call ended. Charles knew the road ahead would be challenging, but he was determined to see it through. His mother's strength had shown him the power of resilience, and now it was his turn to lead by example. The city buzzed with energy, but it wasn't the vibrant hum of progress or celebration. It was the crackling tension of division. On one side of the city square, protesters held signs demanding justice for Eleanor Hampton and broader reforms in the police department. Dignity for all and end implicit bias were scrawled in bold letters across cardboard placards. Across the street, counter-protesters gathered, their chants emphasizing support for the police. Back the blue signs jutted into the air, a stark reminder of the chasm splitting the community. From his office window, Charles Hampton watched the unfolding scene with a heavy heart. This wasn't the change he had envisioned when he became police commissioner. The video of his mother's encounter had ignited a firestorm he struggled to contain, and the flames seemed to grow with each passing day. That evening, Charles hosted a meeting with community leaders at a local civic centre. Among them was his mother, Eleanor, who had reluctantly agreed to join after gentle persuasion. Her presence was a quiet reminder of why this battle mattered. As the meeting began, the room filled with passionate voices. Representatives from activist groups called for immediate action, citing the video as proof of systemic issues. A pastor from a local church emphasised the need for healing and unity while business owners worried about the protests disrupting commerce. The diversity of perspectives only highlighted the complexity of the situation. Commissioner Hampton, one activist said, her tone sharp but respectful. The community needs more than promises. We need policies that protect people like Eleanor Hampton from being treated as suspects in their own neighbourhoods. Charles nodded. I understand your frustration. That's why I've initiated an independent review of the department. We need to address implicit bias and ensure accountability for misconduct, another voice cut in. An independent review is a start, but it's not enough. What about reallocating funds toward community programs? What about holding officers accountable for past actions? Eleanor raised her hand gently, and the room fell silent. I appreciate the passion in this room, she began, her voice steady and calm. But change takes time. If we want lasting reform, we need to work together, not tear each other apart. Her words settled over the group like a soothing balm, though the underlying tension remained. After the meeting, Eleanor pulled Charles aside. You're doing well, son, she said. But remember, this isn't just about me. It's about everyone who's felt the weight of injustice. Focus on the bigger picture. Her advice lingered in Charles's mind as he left the centre. The road ahead was daunting, but her wisdom reminded him of the importance of patience and persistence. The protests continued to swell in size, and among the activists was a young woman named Jasmine, whose fiery speeches had begun to capture the city's attention. Charles first met her during a community forum. She was bold and unrelenting, her words cutting through the noise with clarity and conviction. Commissioner Hampton, she said after the forum, approaching him with a confidence beyond her years. I respect the steps you're taking, 
But let's be honest, your department's problems go deeper than any review can fix. When are you going to stop playing politics and start taking real risks? Her bluntness caught him off guard. I've taken risks my whole career, Jasmine. Joining the force as a black man wasn't exactly a safe choice. That's true, she said, folding her arms. But now you're in a position of power. What are you willing to sacrifice to make real change? Her words stayed with Charles long after their conversation ended. In the days that followed, he began mentoring Jasmine, drawn to her determination and raw honesty. Their discussions often turned to his own compromises, the times he had chosen pragmatism over principle to navigate the system. Jasmine's relentless questions forced him to confront uncomfortable truths, but they also reignited his resolve to push for meaningful reform. The city council meeting was packed, the air thick with anticipation. Charles stood at the podium, addressing a crowd that included supporters, critics and media representatives. He outlined the steps he had taken, the independent review, the disciplinary actions against officers Daniels and Brady, and the introduction of new bias training programmes. But his words were met with mixed reactions. Commissioner, one council member said, her tone sceptical. These measures sound good on paper, but the community needs action, not words. How can we trust this department to change when people like Deputy Chief Harrington are still in power? The question hung in the air, and murmurs rippled through the audience. Charles felt the weight of the room's gaze his usual composure faltering. Before he could respond, a voice from the back interrupted. I have something to say. It was Officer Brady, the younger of the two involved in Eleanor's case. The room turned to him in surprise. Brady stepped forward, his hands trembling slightly. I've been quiet for too long, he began, his voice shaky but determined. What happened with Mrs. Hampton was wrong, and I should have spoken up sooner. But there's more to this than just that incident. He paused, glancing nervously at the cameras and the crowd. There's a culture in the department that protects misconduct. Deputy Chief Harrington has been covering for officers who cross the line, and it's time that stops. The room erupted into a mixture of gasps and murmurs. Charles felt a surge of both pride and concern. Brady's bravery was commendable, but his words would undoubtedly spark a storm within the department. As the meeting adjourned, Charles approached Brady. That took courage, he said, but you've put yourself in a difficult position. I know, Brady replied, but staying silent wasn't an option anymore. Charles nodded, seeing a glimmer of hope in the young officer's actions. With Brady's testimony, the path to addressing corruption within the department became clearer. It wouldn't be easy, but it was a step in the right direction. That evening, as Charles reflected on the day's events, he realised that the divisions in the community and within the department were both obstacles and opportunities. The protests, the criticism and the bravery of individuals like Jasmine and Brady all pointed to one undeniable truth. Change was possible, but only if people were willing to fight for it, together. The walls of Charles Hampton's office felt closer than ever as though the pressure of the city's demands had shrunk the once spacious room. The air buzzed with tension, and every ring of the phone or ping of an email felt like another stone added to the weight on his shoulders. But Charles knew this moment had been coming. The rookie officer Brady's testimony had opened a door that couldn't be closed, and behind it lay a truth that had festered for far too long. Charles summoned Deputy Chief Harrington to his office, as the senior officer entered, his expression betrayed only mild curiosity, as if this was just another routine meeting. Harrington's reputation preceded him, steadfast, unyielding, and deeply entrenched in the old ways of the department. Commissioner, Harrington greeted, taking a seat across from Charles. What's this about? Charles leaned forward, his hands clasped tightly on the desk. I've reviewed the testimony from Officer Brady and the findings from the independent review, he began, his voice steady but cold. There's overwhelming evidence of misconduct, including your role in covering for officers who have violated department policies. Harrington's eyes narrowed. Brady, he scoffed, 
a rookie who barely knows his badge from his flashlight? You're seriously taking his word over decades of experience in this department? It's not just Brady's word, Charles said, sliding a file across the desk. It's body cam footage, complaint records, and patterns that show a culture of corruption under your watch. Harrington's jaw tightened, but he quickly masked it with a smirk. And what do you plan to do with that? You think one man like me is the problem? You think getting rid of me fixes anything? Charles's pulse quickened, but he remembered Eleanor's words. Keep your dignity. Don't let them see you lose control. He took a deep breath. No, Charles admitted. You're not the only problem. The system is broken, and I know it won't be fixed overnight. But letting people like you operate unchecked is why the system stays broken. That ends today. Harrington leaned back, crossing his arms. You're making a mistake, Hampton. You don't have the support to push me out. The department, the union, they'll back me. And when this all blows over, you'll be the one out of a job. Charles stood, his voice rising with resolve. Maybe, but I'd rather lose my job fighting for what's right than keep it protecting what's wrong. By the end of the day, Charles had authorised the release of the investigation's findings. A press conference was scheduled and reporters from every major outlet packed into the briefing room. The city held its breath as Charles stepped up to the podium, the weight of the moment clear in his steady gaze. The events surrounding my mother, Eleanor Hampton, were not isolated, Charles began, his voice carrying the gravity of truth. They are part of a larger issue within this department, a culture of bias, misconduct, and a failure of leadership to hold itself accountable. He paused, scanning the room. Cameras flashed and pens scribbled furiously. Today, I am announcing the dismissal of Deputy Chief Harrington and the officers involved in my mother's case. In addition, a broader inquiry will begin to investigate systemic issues within the department. The room erupted in questions, but Charles held up a hand. This is just the beginning. Change takes time, but I promise this. We will not ignore the truth. We will face it, no matter how uncomfortable or difficult it may be. The fallout was immediate. Supporters praised Charles's courage, while critics accused him of throwing his department under the bus. Inside the precinct, the mood was a mix of relief, unease and quiet rebellion. Some officers applauded his actions, while others whispered that he had gone too far. One evening, as Charles worked late, he found himself staring at a framed photo on his desk. It was an old picture of him and Eleanor from his academy graduation. He was young, hopeful, full of dreams of justice. Eleanor had stood beside him, her pride evident in her radiant smile. What would she think of me now? he wondered. He remembered her advice about small victories and the importance of perseverance. The system was deeply entrenched, but each step forward mattered. Later that week, Charles visited Eleanor at her home. She was in the kitchen, humming softly as she prepared tea. Despite everything, she seemed calm, her serenity a stark contrast to the chaos in Charles's world. You've been on the news a lot, she said, handing him a cup. How are you holding up? Tired, he admitted, sinking into a chair, and questioning if any of this will actually make a difference. Eleanor sat across from him, her hands wrapped around her cup. You're planting seeds, Charles. Change doesn't happen all at once. It happens because people like you keep planting seeds, even when the ground is hard. He looked at her, struck by the quiet strength in her words. But what if the ground never softens? What if the seeds never grow? She smiled gently. Sometimes you plant seeds not for yourself, but for others to see them bloom. Remember, you're not alone in this. Her words brought a measure of peace to his restless mind. He had spent so much time carrying the burden of change alone, but he realised now that change was a collective effort. He wasn't the only one fighting for a better future. Activists like Jasmine, officers like Brady, and even ordinary citizens like Eleanor were part of the same fight. The city responded to the investigation findings with a mix of anger and hope. Protests continued, but the tone began to shift. People saw the beginnings of accountability, 
and while scepticism remained, so did a cautious optimism. Charles knew the work was far from over. He still faced resistance within the department, and the broader inquiry promised to uncover more uncomfortable truths. But he also saw glimmers of progress. Officers like Brady, inspired by his actions, began speaking out against injustices they had witnessed. Jasmine's activism gained momentum, drawing more young people into the movement for reform. As Charles prepared for another day, he thought back to Harrington's parting words. You can't fix the system. Maybe Harrington was right. He couldn't fix it completely. But he could start. And that, Charles realised, was enough. The community forum was buzzing with anticipation. People filled the large hall, some standing, some seated, but all were focused on the stage. The atmosphere was thick with emotion. A local news station had set up cameras in the back of the room, broadcasting the event live. Charles, sitting quietly among the crowd, couldn't help but feel the weight of the moment. Eleanor had agreed to speak at the forum, an invitation that had come after her story had spread far and wide. She had become a symbol of grace under pressure, and now her words could help heal a divided city. As Eleanor walked up to the podium, the room fell silent. At 73, she held herself with quiet dignity. Her skin was weathered, but her eyes were bright, filled with wisdom and a depth of understanding that only came from a lifetime of hardship and triumph. She adjusted the microphone and paused, taking in the faces before her. My name is Eleanor Hampton, she began her voice soft but strong, and I'm here today to speak not only as a mother, but as a citizen of this city. I was humiliated and frightened when the police came to my home, but what hurt most was not the search itself. It was seeing my son, the commissioner, faced with the challenge of balancing his duty to the law and his duty to his family. But that's not what I want to focus on today. What I want to focus on is the future. We have all witnessed the injustice that occurred, but we must remember that this is about more than one incident. It's about a system that has failed, not just me, but so many others. She looked around the room, meeting the eyes of both the protesters and the counter-protesters. Tension lingered, but there was also a quiet respect. The key to healing, my friends, is forgiveness, Eleanor continued, her voice gaining strength. But forgiveness is not the same as forgetting. We must hold people accountable for their actions. We must acknowledge the wrongs. And we must demand change. But we must also work together to create a future where this doesn't happen again. A murmur of agreement rippled through the room. Eleanor paused again, allowing her words to settle. I ask that we come together, not as enemies, not as divided groups, but as a community. Only then can we begin the difficult work of rebuilding trust and creating a system that serves us all equally. Charles watched from his seat, deeply moved by his mother's words. He had always admired her strength, but today he saw it in a new light. She wasn't just his mother. She was a force of calm, wisdom and resilience. As Eleanor finished speaking, a moment of silence followed. Then. A figure stood up in the crowd. Jasmine, the young activist who had been working with Charles on the reform efforts, stepped forward. She'd been at the centre of organising the protests, but today she had something else in mind. Jasmine raised her hand, and with a nod from Charles, she spoke. Eleanor has shown us the path forward, Jasmine said, her voice carrying through the room. It's not enough to demand justice. We must also demand unity. The protesters and the counter-protesters, we must learn to listen to each other, to understand each other's pain. Today, we ask you to join us in a symbolic act, an act of peace, to show the city that we can come together, no matter our differences. Jasmine's words hung in the air for a moment before she stepped to the side, signalling the start of the act. One by one, members from both sides of the protest stood up and began walking toward the centre of the room. At first, it was slow, cautious, but as more people joined in, it became a steady flow, until finally there was a group standing in the centre of the hall, shaking hands, hugging, and standing side by side. 
It was a simple act, but its impact was profound. The room filled with applause, not just for Eleanor's speech, but for the unity that had begun to take root in the hearts of those who had gathered. Charles remained in his seat, his heart full of pride for his mother and her ability to bring people together, even in the most difficult of times. The weight of his own role as a leader had always felt like a heavy burden, but today he realised that true leadership wasn't just about making difficult decisions or confronting injustice. It was also about fostering unity, about creating spaces where people could hear each other, even when they disagreed. He had been so focused on the immediate fight, on the battle against corruption and bias within the police force, that he had lost sight of the bigger picture. Eleanor had shown him a different path, one that involved not just reforming the system, but healing the community it served. In that moment, Charles understood. He had been trying to reform a broken system, but his mother had been trying to heal a broken community. And maybe, just maybe, the two were more connected than he had realised. As the forum drew to a close, Charles walked up to Eleanor, who was now surrounded by people offering thanks and praise. Her face was warm, with a gentle smile, but there was also a quiet exhaustion in her eyes. You were incredible, Charles said, his voice thick with emotion. I'm so proud of you. Eleanor smiled, placing a hand on his arm. You've come a long way, Charles, but remember, real change takes time. Don't rush it. Charles nodded, taking a deep breath. He realised his mother was right. The road ahead would be long and there would be more challenges. But now, he understood the importance of patience and the power of healing. As they left the forum together, Charles couldn't help but feel a renewed sense of purpose. He wasn't just fighting for justice anymore. He was fighting for the future of the community he loved for a world where his mother's strength and wisdom could be passed on to the next generation. And maybe, just maybe, he could make that happen. The city buzzed with energy as the news broke. The rookie officer's testimony had caused a ripple effect that no one had anticipated. The details he provided about the corrupt higher-up, who had been actively working against Charles's reform efforts, were explosive. What began as a small leak of information quickly turned into a tidal wave of truth. As Charles sat at his desk in the days following the announcement, he couldn't shake the feeling of disbelief. The corruption that had been silently festering within the department for years was now exposed. The public, once divided, now rallied behind him, demanding justice and transparency. The testimony from Officer Daniels, the rookie, had been crucial. Daniels had been hesitant at first, unsure of the consequences, but Charles had given him the courage to speak the truth. Now, with the officer's statements verified, the pressure on the department's higher-ups was insurmountable. In a shocking turn of events, two of the most influential figures in the department, those who had opposed Charles's reforms the most, were forced to resign. Their involvement in covering up misconduct and fostering a toxic culture had been too obvious to ignore. Charles felt a mix of relief and sadness. The system was finally starting to change, but it came at a personal cost. These were people he had once respected, but now he understood that true reform meant confronting even those closest to him. Later that evening, Charles visited his mother at her home. The quiet suburban neighbourhood, once a place of calm, now felt like the heart of a movement. Eleanor welcomed him with a warm smile, as she always did. Her calm presence had been the anchor for him through this storm. Mum, Charles began, sitting beside her on the porch swing. It's done. The resignations came through. They're gone. Eleanor took a deep breath, her eyes reflecting a mixture of pride and exhaustion. And what now, Charles? She asked softly. What will you do with the power you now have? Charles paused looking out at the street where children played and neighbours chatted. The changes within the department were just the beginning. I'll keep pushing for change. It's not enough to get rid of a few bad apples. We need real, long-term reform. I won't stop until the system is different, until it's better. Eleanor smiled, her eyes gentle. I'm proud of you, son. You've always wanted to make things better, and now you have the chance to do it on a bigger scale. 
But remember, justice isn't just about punishing the wrongdoers. It's about lifting up the people who need it most. Charles nodded, the weight of her words settling in. He wasn't just fighting against corruption. He was fighting for the people. His mother's strength had always reminded him of that. A week later, the city held a celebration in honour of the progress made. It wasn't just a victory for Charles or the police department. It was a victory for the community as a whole. The streets were lined with banners and a stage was set up in the heart of the neighbourhood. The air was filled with excitement, with people coming together to celebrate. Eleanor stood on the stage, her name now a symbol of change. The community centre, once a simple building, was now officially renamed the Eleanor Hampton Community Centre. A plaque with her name was unveiled and the crowd cheered. Charles stood beside her, his heart full. It was a moment of triumph, not just for his career, but for everything his mother had taught him. She had fought for dignity, for justice, and for the people who needed it most. Today, her legacy was etched into the fabric of the city she loved. As the crowd clapped and cheered, Charles leaned in and whispered to Eleanor, I'll keep fighting, for you, for all of us. Eleanor squeezed his hand, her voice soft but strong. I know, son, and I'll always be here, cheering you on. The celebration continued long into the night, but for Charles and Eleanor, it was a quiet victory. A victory of justice, of healing, and of hope for the future. The road ahead would be long, but it was no longer an impossible one. Together, they had made a difference, and together, they would continue to make change.